Good afternoon, CS19. How are you guys doing today? <laughs> okay, let's try. How are you guys doing? <laughs> it's the end of the quarter. We have made it. In fact, actually, that is one of the things I want to say is, at this point, you guys have worked so hard to do those P sets. The P sets is the biggest chunk of work in CS109, uh, and you guys have done it. So congratulations on making it through this wonderful milestone in CS109. And if you're taking that uh, grace period, then I guess you're very close to being at that point. And just imagine, as soon as you hit submit, I'm like, you rock, congratulations. Um, another quick, quick announcement. Do you guys know that today is the last class? It's our finals lecture, this is it. And after this, we go our ways. Of course, we'll come back together for the final exam, uh, but, but this is it for actually coming to NVIDIA for lecture. Except there is an optional review session. Uh, our wonderful head TA is going to be teaching a review session. It'll be uh, this Friday, and we're gonna use the same class time so that we can make sure that the recordings end up. So even though this is the last regular CS109, if you showed up on Friday, you would learn something cool, or review something cool, rather. Okay, and today uh, I have a nice little conversation about where do I think futures of probabilities could be going, and what do I think could be relevant for you all? What classes could you take afterwards? And then just a, a little bit of reflection of where we've come from. Before we jump into that, any questions about logistics? You guys found the place where the practice final exams? And then on that note, let's jump into things. So, you know, where are we in class? We're at this point where we have made it through all the different parts. You know, we started at the beginning with counting. We went through probability fundamentals learned about single random variables, got into probabilistic models, then got into uncertainty theory before we built upon that foundation and talked about artificial intelligence. If there is one takeaway from today, sorry to interrupt you. If there is one takeaway from today, is I just want you guys to walk out feeling, oh my gosh, there's such an abundance of important problems that I can work on. You know, there's a, a, a whole world of wonderful things that we can do, and this is just the beginning of your own journey. And if I had to add another learning goal today, it would just feeling that, yeah, actually, I worked really hard in CS109, and the person who works on these interesting problems could be me. And I want you guys to all see that potential in yourselves. So that's where we'd like to go. I'm going to tell you a couple quick vignettes, uh, and one of the goals of this is just to give you a little bit of my story of how I got into research and working in my own little corner of probability theory. I also want to tell you that because I have a very interesting flavor of how I do research, and it almost always starts with real word problems that I care about, but then I still get to play in the world of computer science research. I think a lot of people look at research and like, oh, if I want to contribute to human knowledge, I just pick a problem like P versus NP and then I go sit and I work on it for a long time. By the way, you could do that. If you solve it, definitely call me uh, first. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but for me, in reality, it's actually looked quite different. It often starts with, hey, there's this thing I really care about, and if I solve this, I think I could do something neat in the world. Oh, no, there's not a solution for it. Great, I've learned these tools. Could I use these tools for this thing I care about? I have a very short vignette to start with before we jump into a longer story. I had this problem that started with the problem set app. <laughs> you know, we have a bunch of people who are writing probability solutions. And to train TAs, I wanted to say, hey, we've got 300 solutions. Can you give me the 10 most representative so that the TAs can just see classic examples, different ways that people are approaching this problem? So, you know, we can think of it like this. You know, you have 300, I didn't have time to draw 300 dots, but imagine I drew 300 dots, and the goal is just choose 10 of them that, to be really formal, I want the 10 that, if you were to take the distance of every other assignment to its closest dot, you'd minimize those distances, the sum of those distances. Uh, and one thing you're allowed to do is, you can say, for any two assignments, tell me how similar they are. We do have a function for that. We can take two chunks of text and talk about how similar they are. It just doesn't always obey the, the promise that that distance will be what we call Euclidean. So if you want to know the distance between two chunks of text, you just kind of have to call this function. Does the problem make sense? We went to go do this, and it turns out to be an n-squared algorithm. You know, for 300, that's not so bad, but sometimes we want to do the same thing for classes which have 10,000 students, or Code in Place has 18 million students, and we want to help them solve this same problem, and 18 million squared was not a good time. And we were thinking about, okay, can we just do this faster? Because we just want those 10 most represented things. Like, must there be a faster way? I'm gonna just choose one part of this problem, 
And I want to talk about how CS109 actually has the secret to how you could turn this from an n squared algorithm into a O of n log n algorithm. What? Insane. Okay, so here's the, the simpler version of this problem. You don't need to choose the k centroid points, just choose one. Choose the single point that's closest to all the other ones, the single answer that's most representative of everyone in CS109. And you know, one of the ways you could do this is if you want to see if this is the closest point to every single one, you can compare it to every other answer. If you want to know if this is the closest to every other point, you can compare it to every other answer. Uh, that's going to be n squared. But here's a really, really cheeky, simple little uh, idea. Do you guys remember earlier in class when we talked about this problem of unknown drugs and that you want to both understand which one works well and you want to be most useful for people as you go? Did you know you could use that same algorithm in all sorts of wonderful places, including if you want to figure out which assignment is closest to each other's? Think of it like this way. Every single candidate assignment could be thought of as one of your drugs. Wait, that sounds wrong, but you understand what I mean. Uh, each of the solutions is a candidate for being the closest to everybody's. But my claim is, if you think probabilistically, you don't have to do all the work. You can think about every time I do a computation, it's like a trial. It's like you're going to choose one of these candidates and you're going to experiment. And instead of doing n squared experiments, maybe if we think probabilistically, we can get away with doing less. So like maybe you've run two trials of this one, four trials of this one, four trials of this one, and two trials of this one. Every time you run a trial, you get two distances, or a distance rather. Uh, and after you've run those trials, you can have a belief distribution about the average distance. And after you've got belief distribution, let's say this is your belief distribution for the average distance for this, uh, this potential candidate, this potential candidate, this potential candidate, and this potential candidate. Now your task is, well, which one do you want to sample next? And guess what? You don't have to go through all n squared before you're like, I definitely know it's not this one, and I definitely know it's not this one. Maybe my next trial could be between these two. And eventually, the Thompson sampling algorithm tells you, yeah, we're done here. We don't really need to keep trialing to figure out which one's the best. Now, it seems like that would be something that would help, but like maybe we get the wrong answer sometimes. But it turns out like if you set your threshold to be like, I want to be 99.9% .9 confident that you're getting the right answer, you can still get this n squared down into O of n log n. How totally dorky is that? Which is like much more, uh, <laughs> uh, much more CS-y than a lot of my research. But I don't know, maybe I just wanted to tell you the story of like, cared about this problem, we learned about something in CS109. I happened to be teaching CS109 when I was caring about this problem. We just talked about Thompson sampling. Um, and there's all sorts of problems where just, if you just use Thompson sampling, it's better. Thompson sampling falls under a bigger category, bigger category of multi-arm bandits. It's a very fancy way of talking about what we learned in CS109. But there's just all these algorithms where the inner loop would just be way better if you thought a little bit smarter under uncertainty. Why I think that's interesting to say, because like, hey, you guys could have done this. Like, if you'd seen this algorithm and you just thought, I wonder if we took some probability theory, this is totally in the realm of what somebody in CS109 could do, which is pretty cool. And the other thing is, do you guys ever feel like all the problems must be solved? Like, everyone must have solved all the problems and we're just left with P versus NP, and that's 100% not the case. There's all these problems that people just don't know are out there, uh, and we, I just happened to salt, stumble into this one because we wanted to be clustering people's solutions in the problem setup. Okay, so I'd like to tell you some more vignettes, uh, and I'd tell you a little bit about my research. This seems like a good chance to tell you about some of the things that I do. Um, and when I tell you about some of this research, I want to talk about some of the themes that you might see showing up. One of the things that you might see showing up is, hey, we talked a little about deep learning, that was very exciting, but I also want to think a little bit about the theme of probabilistic modeling. Uh, and then one of the themes in CS109 that's kind of interesting is, when do you represent things as single numbers and when do you represent things as random variables? Or if you want to use different terminologies, distributions versus point estimates. You guys want to go on this little journey? Our last little journey. Well, let's do it, okay. <laughs> um, and, as I told you, I'm gonna now tell you maybe the, the broader thrust of my research, but you'll see that that little vignette I gave you is really emblematic of how I've found all these problems that I thought were interesting to work on, that you could have found and you could do cool things too. Uh, and a lot of it for me always starts with application and then ends up to some cool theory thing. 
There is one application I care so much about. Like if in my life I could move the needle a little bit in this application, I'd feel so good. And it's this quality education gap that exists in our world. You know, there's all sorts of people who don't even get access to education, but if you throw in like quality education, the sorts of wonderful learning experiences that we've all had access to, how great would it be if like everyone in the world could have as great an educational background if they so choose? Uh, and you can tell that story in terms of like traditional statistics, like who gets to go to university, but you can also tell the story of like, you know, people who want to get retrained uh, because they want to find new jobs. Uh, and even specifically, you could talk about the story within the world of computer science. Uh, there's so many learners out there who would love to get access to the ability to learn things. There's all sorts of reasons to believe that we might be able to move the needle. Uh, people have access to technology that didn't exist before. Um, as you may guess, like, you know, certainly more than half the world has access to a smartphone and that number is growing pretty quickly. So as we have technology in people's hands, can we actually move this needle? We also have other reasons to be excited that maybe we'll be able to move it is the data we've got is pretty unprecedented. Um, there is places like code.org where a bunch of people are learning to program. And to give you a sense of that, here's a little picture of all the K-12 students, so between kindergarten and senior year students uh, in high school or in, in the United States. And this is the fraction who have tried code.org. A huge amount of people. Um, and by the numbers, they have had 42 million unique and enrolled students from 180 uh, countries, uh, and they have half a billion hour of code sessions, uh, and a much smaller number of papers published with our lab. But this is a very interesting amount of data. Like, could we actually learn wonderful things about the learning process from this data? I don't know, but that would be pretty cool. Um, and then the final reason to feel some hope is, there's tools that exist now that didn't exist for the thousands of years that people have cared about education. Well, maybe they cared for it, about it for even 2,000 years. Uh, but in those years, they did not have access to some of the things we have. Like, you know, when I was your age, speech recognition wasn't possible. I was told it was an unsolvable problem. I wouldn't see the solution in my academic lifetime, and now we have it all on our phones. Uh, so we have this very wonderful intersection. We still have the clear societal need. We have all sorts of new data sets, uh, and we have this this renaissance of great ideas and new tools that exist there. And my hope is that somewhere in this mix, we'll actually be able to move the needle. That would be so neat. There is one problem that's been pretty sticky for me. You know, I've been a teacher for a long time. I was also a TA. Uh, my parents are teachers. Man, like education is like the family business, I suppose. <laughs> and you hang out with teachers enough and they'll start complaining about grading because it's a lot of work. And one of the ways of telling the stories of how maybe we could make a small improvement on high quality education is maybe we could help teachers by improving our assistance when they're trying to give feedback. Feedback is important, but it's very, very labor intensive. We could talk about this story of let's give feedback in lots of different domains. Maybe it's middle school math, maybe it's people learning how to program, maybe it's people who learning how to program cool things like pyramids. Um, this is really random, but the US government publishes all the immigration tests, which is very, very strange, but you know, it's public data, so it could be like people trying to uh, pass the US citizenship test, um, or maybe it's like somebody who's just doing some open play. In all these domains, students produce wonderful work, but it's easy to produce that work and hard for teachers to give feedback. Chapter zero in our story is gonna be like, oh man, when I was a PhD student and I was just starting simple. Uh, <laughs> we, we, I, you know, I found a friend who worked at this startup at the time called Khan Academy and he said they have this problem. They see students, but they, Based on their history, they'd like to be able to understand the students better, but they said they had trouble doing this. So they gave us a big data set and we're like, okay, can we try and understand people a little bit better? So we would take their past, we built a little bit of a machine learning model and we would try and predict their future. We built a model that got pretty good at this. It's an old problem. Hey, this is me when I was a baby. <laughs> and this is when the problem was first posed. People have been thinking about it for a long time. But since I had access to these new deep learning tools, we can do a really cool job of modeling it. We built a big neural network, first one for education, and it worked pretty well. We were able to predict uh, student futures, you wanna be high on this graph, uh, way better than their baseline, or even kind of the, the forefront of what people were doing at that time. 
We then took our model, we're like, hey, can you tell us about eighth grade math? And it figured out all these cool things. It said, here's how eighth grade math is uh, set up. This is like, you have to figure out how to solve the x axis of an equation before you can figure out solving y, but the slope is the center point of all these concepts, uh, and it's a good time. And then we started to do cool things like, can we do optimal teaching? And by optimal teaching, I'm like, can we figure out exactly what you know and what you need to learn next? So like, based on your past, I'm like, you definitely need to work on uh, figuring out square roots. Uh, and there's reason to believe that if you could understand students and you can make good decisions under uncertainty for students, we could get people to know more faster. And this was fine, but it's chapter zero for a reason. I have a baby now, I didn't at the time. But at the time I could imagine having a baby and I thought when I do have a baby and she lives in the future of education, I don't want her to solve just simple correct or incorrect problems. Uh, and that, is exciting, you know, I want her to be doing more open-ended work. I want her to be engaging with exciting, thought-provoking problems, not just, you know, solve this uh, multiple choice question. Now, while that's what I want, it turns out it's a lot harder to be able to understand students in open-ended domains. Like, for example, you'd imagine coding when you're writing a few lines of code, it can't be that hard to give feedback. But it turns out it's tragically hard. And if you go to some of the, like, the best coding learning experiences online, um, they'll tell you things like, uh, all they can tell you is, you're missing a line that I know is in the solution, and it's just not the sort of deep feedback that we want. So we're like, okay, let's work on that problem. And to pose it a little formally, the problem looks like this. Imagine you have a task a student's working on. Imagine you have the student's work itself. Can you fill in a rubric? And that rubric is a bunch of Boolean decisions about what feedback to give the student. I was like, okay, that sounds fun. Let's jump in it. Uh, we had a bunch of Stanford TAs label this for a whole, uh, whole bunch of submissions uh, from 106A and Code in Place. We learned a bunch of things from looking at this problem. First of all, can't we just use some core conditional probabilities Turns out you can, but you know, this F1 score, which is a measure of how well you're doing, you don't get that much lift on an F1 score. This is what humans look on that measure of how good you are at filling in these rubrics. Humans are great, and conditional probability is just not that good. Well, deep learning's just gotta be the solution to everything, right? So we have all this data from code.org. Uh, can we just use some deep learning? I also wondered, can we use some dynamic analysis? You know, actually one of the fun little sides we went on to is, how creative can we get? What if we didn't just look at the code? What if we looked at something more interesting? Do you guys wanna just have a moment of zen and appreciate half a million people learning to code, their very first program, and watch it visualized uh, in this graph? Can you guys see this? Can you see there's a pink dot? Okay, that pink dot is students. And see that big circle? The big circle means half a million students. All these pink dot students are starting with blank code and they're trying to write a five line program here is the solution. So you can imagine they're trying to get to that bottom right corner. Uh, can you guys see these little black dots? Maybe not. Can you? Yeah. It's like the distribution of yeses goes from pretty high to like a little bit. Um, anyways, there's these black dots which are intermediate work. Let's watch them go. This is a dance of half a million people trying to write a five line program. Most people do pretty similar thing first, but then you have the first splits. And this big group's kind of making a good progression, but like, uh-oh, those guys are going the wrong way. And the people who go the wrong way are very likely to then go even more wrong ways. Now, at this point, we've got our first group of students making it. Yay, good job, you solved the problem. Uh, but then you're left with, you know, a couple hundred million people who are still trying to write that five-line program. There's a bunch of things to take away from this. Certainly the observation that people who make mistakes are more likely to make more and more mistakes. And the other thing is a moment of appreciation. Can you appreciate that struggle and that grit? Like some people in this data set spent more than 12 active hours of work just trying to write a five line program. The five line program, I will tell you, has no loops, is move, turn left, move, turn right, move. That is hard for people and they did not give up. Like, so yes, respect to you guys. All of you guys have our total respect. And these people, these people are like, I've been working on this five line program for like three hours and I just made it like little tears are welling up in their eyes and they're feeling like I can do it. But maybe there's something in this process of how people solve the problems that can help us out. So we can jump into this. We can say, 
we can jump into every single student who's written move, move, turn left, and maybe there's some temporal dynamics for students who have written that program that tells us what they should do next. So can you guys give some feedback here? Student has written move, move, uh oh, that second move crashes, turn left. What would you want them to do next? Would you want them to do move, turn left, turn the turn left into a turn right, or add another move forward afterwards? Who wants this one? Yeah, that's like the nice teacher of us. Who wants this one? Some people just want to watch the world burn. Uh, <laughs> so we kind of have this idea that, yeah, yeah, they, should, they have a bug, they should get rid of the bug. If you look at what people, like we have you know, millions of people who have made this exact mistake, most people who make this mistake go on to try this next. So it turns out the crowd's a little bit unwise. So if we wanted to get into probability, we have to think a little bit more deep than just can we use conditional probabilities. One of the things we thought about at the time was like, well, traditional conditional probability asks, condition on somebody making this mistake, what do they do next? But I don't want to condition on, condition on them making the mistake because that's all the people who are having misconceptions. I would like to be able to ask the conditional question conditioned on the average student. And so based on that, we came up with this idea of like, how could we model what the average student does? We said, well, for the average student, you can imagine all the submissions coming at you as a Poisson process from how appealing it is to the average student. And based on this, we could say like, the expectation of the length of their path will be the sum of one or the expectation of their Poisson. And so we end up with this like Poisson minimal path that could give you an idea of what the average student would do next from a current state. It, for any state, you can ask what is the Poisson minimal path next, and it gave this really nice problem-solving path, uh, path. And it worked so well for six-line programs. Like with this really cool probability theory, it was really neat. We got to title something the Poisson common path, which felt badass, what a flex. Uh, but it didn't work really well for <laughs> problems after six. Um, okay, so now it's time to go back to the drawing board. At this point, I had convinced my PhD advisor that deep learning was not a fad, and like he finally gave me the green light to go try this deep learning thing, and we tried the deep learning thing. TLDR, it didn't work, but we did try a whole bunch of really cool things. First, we started a regular neural network, didn't work. Then we're like, no, our neural network needs to be way fancier. So we made hierarchical uh, neural networks. We'd take code, put it as a tree, and we had tree-shaped neural networks. So you have like a neural network for each node, and they would merge together into a new neural network for like the compound node. It was so cool. But didn't work that well. So then we tried this other thing. We're like, whoa, what if we got triplets of code? Like, I can take all of 106A and I can, I can mine oh, millions and millions of these triplets where you have the precondition, the code, and the postcondition itself. I got lots and lots of these. And then I'm gonna make a neural network that can take a precondition of code and predict the postcondition. It's gonna be fantastic. Seemed like a really good idea. So we would take a neural network which would encode the precondition, uh, put it through a neural network which would translate into encoded postcondition, then decode it, and then it would give us the postcondition, and we trained this, and it felt awesome, and we managed to write a paper, but it was basically useless. Going back to this chart of like how we're doing at grading, all of this effort, and we made some progress, but it just was very far shy, far cry for humans. I went to Percy Liang. I'm like, Percy, you know all the neural networks. What can we do here? And we worked together and we tried to figure out, and we still couldn't make progress. So, you know, there's another problem here. We wanted to be able to give this feedback, but for most teachers, you don't even get to look at a huge labeled data set. You kind of have to give feedback for the very first time you give the assignment. So you really want what we call one-shot learning. Like, as soon as you give an assignment, the first student to hand it back to you, you should be able to grade. So uh, we needed that, and we need to be able to verify. Like, deep learning is really cute, and it just makes predictions. But you guys have been writing problems at six. Like, would you trust all these predictions? Like, I don't know. Like, I don't know why I should trust these things. They're giving me probabilities, but it could be making mistakes. It's not verifiable. You can't prove for sure that someone's deserving the grade that they got. So we went back to the world of probability. We tried to understand why is this problem so hard? Do you guys want to know the cool thing we discovered? All of student work follows the same probability distribution. Not just some of it, not just code, not just essays, not just poems, not just partial solutions, all of it follows the same probability distribution, called a Ziffian distribution. And what that means, Ziffian distributions on the ranking, like the, the, prop, pro, uh, the popularity of like the most common solution and the popularity of the second most common solution. 
So if you take the most common solution, this is how probable it is. If you take the second most common solution, this is how probable it is. And every single educational data set that I ever got my hands on, when I looked at the log of the rank and the log of the probabilities, you always saw the straight line, which led to this probability density function, which comes from ZIF distribution. Whoa, that's cool. It's like the fattest tail distribution you can ever imagine. By fat tail distribution, I mean like there's a lot of probability far away from the mean. So this is the most probable solution. It has a probability like this. If I didn't do it in log log space, you know what this thing looks like? It just goes on forever. This tail is incredibly large. And it just basically says, yeah, the, the most common solution is probable and everything else looks incredibly unlikely. And you guys know this, this is like the, 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 maybe there's one solution that lots of people come up with, but as soon as you're doing something other than the solution, you're in that really, really, really long tail. Uh, so that makes it a hard problem. And there's also this other problem is, you know, when we cluster solutions, there is this sharpness, which is like two solutions could be really, really similar in how they look in their text, but mean really, really different things. Like you might just be a couple characters away from the right answer and there's a big difference between those two things. So for those two reasons, it's hard. Oh, long story short, yeah, they're all ZIF. Want to learn more about it? Talk to this guy. Okay, <laughs> so are we just done? No, back to the drawing board, don't give up. We really want to be able to make progress on this problem. I was inspired by this paper. There was this wonderful paper I told you guys about in the very first class, and the reason I told you about it is because it was so inspirational to me. The inspirational idea was there's this algorithm that can learn from a single example. Most deep learning, you show it 100,000 examples and then it can learn a symbol. But this one, the very first time you showed a symbol, it could learn to recognize other instances of that symbol. Wow, how amazing. It did it not just for symbols, but also for object recognitions. It could do all these one-shot learning problems. Uh, and this is how it worked. They did not use deep learning. They used Bayesian models instead. And the idea was they took a lot of examples of characters and they used it to algorithmically create a Bayesian program, you know, like one of our Bayes nets. And the Bayes net would describe the generative story of where characters came from. It's like, hey, you want to know where this comes from, pal? Well, it starts with some primitive shapes. Those get put together into subparts. Those subparts get connected, and there's some random variable controlling the connection. Each of these things is defined, you know, the probability conditioned on its parents, just like in our Bayes nets, and they would have productions at the end that would actually be characters. And then if you wanted to take a character and predict, they would infer into the Bayes net using some pretty reasonable inference techniques, not too different from what we did. Okay, I'm gonna skip some of these things. Oh, there is some neatness to this. Not only could you predict, but you could also generate. You can say, like, give me more examples of this, and the <laughs> very poor handwriting algorithm would give you more examples. So it could do more than just prediction, which I also thought was quite cool. But really, the big takeaway was this. They had people try and do the classification task, and people are awesome. In this case, you want to be low in error rate. People did a really great job. Deep learning was doing an okay job, and some of the most modern models were being pretty effective, but this Bayesian network did way better than the deep learning and even did better than humans, which is very, very impressive on this task. And I read this, and I was a little jealous. You know, happened. But I was also a little bit inspired, and I was like, what if we made a Bayesian network of how humans think about their 10-line programs? And so we did. And here's the really interesting insight about a Bayesian network, if I could put it into the language that we've learned. Here's what grading is written as a probabilistic inference task. You have a couple random variables. One thing you have a random variable for is the code itself. So let's say this is representing the code. And over here, you're trying to predict like maybe their ability and maybe the choices that they made when they were writing this code. Because if I can look at your code and, in, and guess the choices you made, I can give feedback on the choices. Be like, oh yeah, that choice to use recursion, bad call. Um, and you know, maybe at the end of the day, if I'm doing grading, I might want to get a score out of this. And it just turns out this is a very hard probability problem to solve, even for humans. I see your code and I have to infer choices. That is very difficult. But the insight that really came from this paper is that the reverse conditional probability is a lot easier for humans. If I tell you, here's all the choices somebody has made, what could their code look like? 
That is the reverse conditional, and that is pretty reasonable for humans. So uh, in this case, you know, we have the student ability, <laughs> um, we have their choices, and you have a resulting Python code, and we made a generative model which says, okay, first choose a student ability. Then based on the ability, make some choices, like have them walk through the assignment and make some decisions. Do you do recursion? Hopefully not, but we're gonna make some choices for them. And then the task was, can I write a program that would say, what could code look like given those choices? And then the simple idea is, what if we made a nice little interface so that teachers could write this program? So they could say, okay, in my assignment, here's the choices I think students will make. And maybe I could write it in a way that we can explore the exponential number of choices that they can make. And maybe I could write it in a way that I could describe, based on their choices, what their output could look like. Wrote this nice little library, it was called idea to text and you would write each choice as a class. Come talk to me if you wanna know the details. Uh, but it kinda of looked like this. We would say, here's the decision making process and Every time you make a decision, we'll be outputting code that the student could be writing. And so after you're done with the decision-making process, you've got both their choice of decisions and their solution. This code was generative. Do you remember when we wrote BayesNets and we hit a program and you would start to see samples of a bunch of fake students? I had the same thing. Once we'd written this you know, slightly more complicated Bayesian network, we'd hit run and we'd start popping out made up students. Be like, here's a made up student. It made some made up choices and here's the corresponding code. And we could run it not one time, not 10 times, not a million times, but a billion times. You know, students and teachers had not too much trouble describing this generative decision making process. And then we could have a fake data set with billions of students without even having to wait for the first student to show up. Um, and then, you know, the idea was we did some sort of Bayesian decision-making process, or sorry, independent thing where you'd say, I'm going to make my next choice, and I'm gonna be as independent of previous choices as possible. Um, you know, come talk to me if you're curious about the details, but it was really that. We just had a crazy way for people to write the conditional likelihood in one direction, then we did Bayes' theorem to figure out what choices uh, a new student had made, uh, and we got to the point where we can for some code outperform humans, which was crazy to me. I thought we had given up on this project, but um, you know, the student who led this thing got a paper award, it was a good time. Uh, and it turns out, at this point, we're just like having a party, because we're like, we've got this cool little Bayesian code and we're gonna use it on all your homeworks. Uh, you know, we did intro math and stuff like that, and it, it, it was working pretty well. And this is actually where I got to know. That was such a good time, man. What a party we had in 2019. Um, <laughs> now, I will note that, of course, this does hit a, a ceiling. Um, it didn't work for things beyond 106A. But before we get to that, uh, you know, there's a couple things that we got to do along the way that was quite neat. Like you could take students who are learning how to draw a pyramid and you could break down their process. And so instead of just giving feedback to students on their final solution, we could look at how each student got from their empty code to the, the final solution. We could just be like, okay, this student was at stage one for a long time and then finally jumped to the answer. Whereas this student you know, went back and forth between stages and took a long time to get to the answer. Um, and you know, we could tell teachers, hey, your students, here's where they're all stuck on as they're trying to solve problems once we had some data. And then finally, this is one of the dreams that we're still working on is to actually be able to provide nice feedback to a student saying like, yes, the problem set app says you got the question right, but let's talk about your process of how you got to that answer and how can I help you learn a better process so that you're better able to solve future problems. So this is a dream and we're still working on it. Uh, but you know, when we were able to give people feedback on their process, boy did we see a huge improvement in both how long they would take but also in exam scores. So there's reason to believe if you could pull this off, which I have not been able to do so far uh, in more complicated assignments, we could really, really improve learning, which was, remember, the original goal. So feedback on process, can you guys solve it? Please call me first. No, I just go, don't have to call me first. If you solve this, just go tell the world, call the New York Times first. Um, now, at this point, we were having a good time, but we still knew that there was this one challenge which we kind of sucked at, which is in CS106A, we would give a midterm. And the midterm at this time was something that you didn't have access to a compiler to. I think that's still the case. 
Yeah, you don't have a compiler on your 1.6a midterm, which means that people write code, but it looks a little bit more like pseudocode. It's kind of like in CS 1.9 when we ask for code on midterm. Like, that code doesn't run. Uh, and we're still giving you a good feedback based on that. And we really had trouble giving feedback on 1.6a midterms. And to give you an idea of what it looks like to grade a 1.6a midterm, you have like the question that they solve, the code that they wrote, and a rubric. And it's just the code doesn't run. But it turns out we managed to pull this off. And this time we didn't get into the New York Times. And the idea was, you know, on this task, humans are again quite good. Not perfect though, we know that regrade request, woof. Uh, but deep learning at this point really wasn't helping. Even deep learning from 2020 when we applied all our cool Bayesian things wasn't getting us very far when you got to this level of complexity. And so we're like, can't give up. Just gotta try something new. And I guess that's part of it. We just never stop trying things. Uh, and the good idea here is, why grade one exam when you could grade all the exams? <laughs> we always tried to solve one problem at a time. We'd be like, we're gonna take this one problem, we've got 700 solutions, let's just try and make a model just for this problem. But at this point, we're like, that's not enough. Let's try and write something that can generally solve grading for any problem, which sounds harder, but it turns out by doing this harder thing, it actually became easier. So we built a grading system which took in three inputs. Okay, give me the student's answer, obviously I'm grading that, but tell me which question they were grading, and tell me the rubric you want me to fill in, and then I'll make my decisions. I'll understand the student, and then I'll make my decisions based off of that. And boy, did we write a neural network. It was like the heftiest little neural network ever. Because that neural network is taking in, like over here, it's got the question embedding, so we take the question, like write a Python program. Some questions are hard, easier than others. We put it through a neural network which ended up with a set of neurons, which we call a vector. We took the rubric, which is like uses proper syntax, put that through its own neural network, which ended up with a set of activated neurons, took both of those things and combined it with this other neural network that's kind of the same structure. This is the same structure as what GPT does. Obviously not like GPT chat in terms of its capacity because it don't have a billion dollars of training, but we use the same architecture, cute. Um, and we take the student solution sequence and you put those three vectors together to try and end up with a prediction for how the student would do on this rubric. And it worked, woo. <laughs> and we gave it to students in code in place. We're like, there's a lot of you. And we're like, hey, who wants to take a CS 106A midterm? And like 4,000 of them were like, sure, it's not for grades. So like a lot of people are like, no, I don't want to take a midterm. But 4,000 were like, yeah, I want to take a midterm. We're like, we can't grade you. And they're like, that's fine, we'll just take the midterm anyway. So they did the midterm. Uh, this is the people who took the midterm. <laughs> and then we're like, hey, surprise, we could give you feedback, but a lot of that feedback's gonna come from an AI, but some of it will come from a human. Uh, and so we gave feedback to 3,500 students. 10% came from humans, 90% came from AI. We didn't tell them what the feedback came from. They would just be like, here's your code. Here's the feedback that we came up with. By the way, we just predicted a rubric and then we wrote really fancy text to go with the rubrics. And then we did a little bit of cute derivatives. We said, what is the derivative of your change in your belief of this conditioned on each character, and then we could highlight that this is what led them to my prediction. And we gave it to students, and then we let them do a thumbs up. Was this helpful or a thumbs down? No, it wasn't helpful. Uh, and students agreed with the AI feedback slightly more with the human feedback. We didn't just ask students, we also asked teachers. We did all of our fairness analysis to make sure it worked for different uh, demographics. Uh, and yeah, it was a good time. What a vibe. Um, Okay, and we think it, it, it nicely, we didn't have to get too deep into ethics because it seems the model both satisfied um, parity as well as calibration, which was lucky. It didn't mean we had to make a hard trade-off. Okay, and that's just one example in my world. Like, boy, that took like a decade of trying things and getting things wrong. But that is just one of the many problems. Like when I went through this deck of words, I'm like, there's open problems everywhere. I think one of the great ones is feedback for teachers. So many people are teaching and we're not getting feedback on what is working and it's not working. But for example, Chile and Colombia, they both have this system of they have recordings for all of their teachers and they just wanna be able to take the recording and give that teacher some automatic feedback. Um, so there's an interesting open problem. An interesting problem that we're still working on that we think is really cool is taking transcripts uh, and giving feedback to teachers. So again, in code in place, people taught in small groups of 10, and we had 5,000 transcripts of teaching sessions. 
And we're like, can we give some feedback to these teachers? And the other was like, yeah, we did. We, we did some statistical analysis, found times when teachers took up student ideas. We found times when people did questions, um, gave some feedback to teachers. And then the teachers who got feedback asked more questions and took up student ideas more. The students who are the recipients of this teacher feedback recommended the class more and found section more helpful, which was a good vibe. Uh, one of the problems that we still find interesting is what if people did really exciting programs? Like, what if they were creative? Like, we didn't tell them. We just said, like, make a cool game. And then they made a cool game. And now we have to give them feedback. You're like, my grad students are like, Chris, why are you doing this to me? Can't we keep life simple? And I'm like, no, life is complicated and messy. Let's go enjoy. Uh, so <laughs> we're building this algorithm that can learn to play students' work to try and separate the difference between this is wrong and doesn't show programming knowledge from that was super creative and it did something that we've never seen before, uh, which has been a good time and we keep writing papers about it. Though that's not yet, it's, it's almost at the point where we can put it in production and we might try it this spring, but not sure yet. Um, more than education, I think uh, one of the folks that we have started talking to recently is the FDA because they're approving drugs. And you know that problem we talked about earlier? They're still trying to figure out how they can do their drug approval process in a more humane way, in a way that's more appropriate. And there's a bunch of reasons that they don't do it so well right now. One is because they don't use probabilistic sampling. Like, come on, guys, Thompson sampling has been an algorithm for like 30 years now, or popular for the last 10 at least. But the other reason that's really complicated, I don't know if you guys know this, but when they do their testing, they don't do it on random samples of people. A lot of drugs are tested on one demographic more than another, and an easy one to point to is very few drugs are tested on women of the age where they could possibly be, be pregnant because no one wants to take on that risk. And so a lot of these drugs have not been tested on a full population. And so they make really bad predictions then in efficacy because sometimes there are differences. Uh, and so trying to help them think through the probabilities has been some interesting ongoing conversation. I've already talked about eye test enough. Um, but the eye test was interesting. <laughs> Just let me tell you one thing about it. It was like, what really was the eye test about? It was basically just looking at this being and be like, dude, that should be a random variable. Like you're telling my vision as a number, but it should be a random variable. Like that's basically the idea I had. And so maybe if you guys were to think about getting into research, maybe that's a nice way to start. Like I just feel like I walk around the world and everybody's just using numbers when they should be random, using random variables. And maybe you'll walk around the world and be like, I'm pretty sure that's a random variable and not a number. And maybe that could be a start of a cool little investigation for you guys. So. Uh, oh, <laughs> I forgot I wrote this out there. Yeah, definitely, Chris. I completely agree. No one's done that, though. Uh, so <laughs> okay. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that AI can't do. Uh, can't understand link. Well, well <laughs> social science, it can't really do a good job of. I can't explain why it made the choices it do. It's still struggling to teach humans, like even GPT chat, like it's very effective, like quite interesting, but it's not exactly pedagogically inspired. There's a whole bunch of things that AI can't do that maybe you could do if you want to apply yourself. So what should you guys do next? Like kind of the point of that story was to talk about you guys, not talk about me. And I really want you to feel you have the permission to go amongst the world and get amongst the abundance of open, wonderful problems out there. I think we're all on a little quest to find the problems and the causes we care about. I happen to find education as my cause, and within the cause of education, I saw that there's abundance of wonderful problems out there. You guys will have your own causes and your own things that you're interested in. And I wish you just all the best on this wonderful journey to choose those problems, because they're all out there. They're like hidden under the stones. Sometimes you look at the world and you're like, everything's been solved, but then you just take a second to stop and look around and you're like, no, there's so many ways that we could do so much better in the society of ours. Now, one of the ways is just to go out there and get amongst it. Some of you guys have started that with the challenge project. Sometimes you're already on this path to discovery of a problem that calls to you. And also, other things you can do is take classes, because that's always a good vibe too. But maybe in the classes, you'll intersect with new ideas uh, that will give you inspiration for your cause and your problems. A couple ones I want to point out that you might find interesting. You know, this class didn't exist when I was an undergraduate. It's called Decision Making Under Uncertainty. And it is a grad level class. 
but it's kind of like the intellectual next step for CS109. And I've talked to people who've taken it and they're like, this is so fun. And you, maybe you want to wait till you've got enough maturity to take a grad level class, but you certainly after 109 will have the mathematical foundations uh, for this class. And it's really wonderful. One of the things I'd point out about this class and others is that it has this great final project and they give you a whole chunk of the quarter and say, okay, take an instance where you try out working on a problem and cause that you care about. Make it into a final project. And that's so wonderful and you'll get TA support for that. You could also take CS221 or CS229. Those are kind of the artificial intelligence next steps. 221 is technically called artificial intelligence. 229 is called machine learning. What's the difference these days? I guess in like 229 you're not allowed to use a BayesNet, but in 221 you are. <laughs> well, I don't know. I guess they're very, very similar these days, but you know, 221 you'll talk about more things. Uh, it's a slightly bigger introduction to artificial intelligence. But they also, I think they're very similar classes, they also have this property where the last half of the classes, you guessed it, choose a project that you find inspiring and work on it. So if you took these cl three classes, you've had three instances of trying a problem and finding one that might speak to you. Now maybe after all that you're like, I want to keep going. Oh my god, there's this class 228 called Probabilistic Graphical Models. And they will teach you the future of Bayesian networks. And the future of Bayesian networks is wild. It's like we can combine deep learning and Bayesian networks and we can learn structures and do all these wild things. Uh, and it is a class I did take. And I would say, in my life, I've never taken a class that was so hard, but also <laughs> I have never taken a class that I learned so much from. And actually, I'll be honest, I stumbled through it at some point. I was just like, I don't know, tired that quarter. I took too many units and like at the end I was like, oh my gosh. And then later I got to my PhD somehow, managed to like, you know, <laughs> ignore that one class that didn't go so well. Got into the PhD and immediately started working on stuff that required that class. And I'm like, oh God. <laughs> so, so then I learned it. <laughs> At that point, I was like, I needed it. So then I, I went back and I, I hope that's not everyone for CS109, but like maybe one day you'll need it. You'll go find that course where you'll be like, oh, I get you Thompson sampling. Anyways, um, and then certainly if you're just like, all these classes have the component where they're both programming and math. And I think the programming is a good way to solidify the math you're learning. But if you just want to go down pure math, there is a pure math path for you. It's called STATS 200. Uh, and you get to continue this wonderful process of learning the math in CS109 uh, in, the, in the more pure math direction. What a cool place to be. Now, courses are a cool way to get inspired, and because I think one of the things that you learn when you have a course is you build your tool set. But if there was a takeaway for your future, I would talk about intersectionality. It's like, I happened to do my first research project when I was in 221. I, I'd done projects before and they all totally like fizzled out, but the 221 project totally stuck and it became my first research project. So these classes will give you space and they'll give you techniques. But the other thing that I would encourage you to work on, and that's kind of this quadrant, between now and then is to focus on these other ways that you can find your own little nook. I love this about the world. We all have different lived experiences. And you know what that means? That means you have different insights into pain points in the world than the person next to you. We've all seen different things. We know where the world could be better. And that means you have knowledge of problems that I don't have knowledge of problems. And that's wonderful because maybe that's where you'll find the intersection that speaks the most to you. In addition to your lived experiences, we all have different passions. You know, like, I care about education, but I also care about, I don't know, guitar and, uh, and frisbee, but maybe your passions bring you elsewhere. Maybe, I definitely talk to somebody like, I'm so into ballet choreography, and ballet choreography, like, I want to explore this world probabilistic. I'm like, wow, crazy cool, so wonderful. So, you know, you've got your lived experiences, you've got your passion, Sometimes data can be quite interesting and helpful, so maybe you've worked a job um, that gave you access to some data set that's interesting, and explore all these things and keep looking for intersections where, you know, when you put a couple of these things together, it's like, I went to Stanford, I learned this tool. I have this lived experiment that tells me about this problem, and because I worked as an internship that worked on that problem, I have access to a data set, and you might find yourself in an intersection where there's nobody. And there's not prior work. And that's hard because you're going to have to do something that no one's done before. But maybe that's how you get your first step into this wonderful world of research. Okay. That's what I've got. You know, I, I just, I love it. And you guys don't have to all do research, but I just want you to get that feeling of you're closer than you've ever been in your life to that, that frontier of what humans know. 
And that frontier has more space to take classes, but there's also parts of this manifold where you might be able to take that step across the frontier and you're closer than you possibly might imagine. The other thing I wanted to do today is, it's our last class. I was thinking about that, I'm gonna miss you guys. You've been a wonderful class, my God. I don't think there's ever been a class that's asked more questions in my 10 years of teaching. You guys asked so many questions, you engaged, you worked hard, it, I will miss you guys all. This has been one of the special CS109s for me. And so I did wanna take a moment and reflect on where we've gone and how we got here. We know about our journey, but do you guys remember the very beginning? You like came to class, oh man. And I was like, we're gonna learn counting. And that's where we started. We learned counting. And not just, you know, one to 10, but even more. We learned sorting, combinations, uh, putting things in buckets. We learned all these different rules. And counting was hard. Um, but, you know, even though you guys were engaging in a very hard thing, we're trying to also build a course community. A course community where, like, you know, we appreciate that we're all people and we're all just trying to do the best we can. This was, for me, really the first quarter that wasn't defined by COVID which kind of makes it defined by COVID, by being the first quarter after COVID. But uh, you know, this was a first time of coming together co-presently after this crazy thing that we lived through. Um, and you guys were both doing this hard thing of learning counting and also this very important work of rebuilding community. Uh, and part of the <laughs> rebuilding community that we uh, engaged with was we did that serendipity problem where you figured out the probability of running to a person. We did some cool things. We made history in class, you guys remember? I brought a deck of cards and we did something that no one ever done before because I shuffled it seven times, and shuffling it seven times gives an order that we're pretty sure has never ever been seen in the history of the world. That happened in class. <laughs> and at this point, you're ready to learn what a probability was. So we've just been counting, and then you're ready. You can learn probabilities. And then, you know, probabilities were exciting, but what was really exciting was conditional probability, because then you could infer ideas based on evidence you collected. Um, did some cool things, played some Monty Hall, did some prediction of a Zika test, did some Bayes theorem where we said, okay, based off of a medical test result, uh, we can figure out what your problem is. At, in your problem set, you wrote a general solution to this, which is something quite new for CS109. Historically in CS109, I'd make people solve single instances of Bayes theorem. But in this class, I made you write the code for the general solution. I give you like any medical test with its probabilities and you had to figure out for any medical test what was the probability that somebody had disease. Whoa, that's hard, but that's more general. And I hope it was, my, my theory was that by writing the more general thing that you guys would understand this more than any previous 109. And then we bummed it up a notch. We're like, why do Bayes theorem with only two outcomes when you do Bayes theorem with nine outcomes? And you guys are like, problem set app, why? <laughs> Uh, we talked about a bull, a bass, man, things were starting to get a little bit more exciting. As things got more exciting, oh, it's got this funny tooltip thing. That's definitely not, that's definitely not, but uh, <laughs> I took a screenshot and somehow I got the tooltips wrong. But the important point was, you know, speaking of community, at this point, you guys were getting to the heftier parts of CS109. And the TAs stepped up. We did 50% more office hours than we've done in the past. The TAs are like, Okay, the students are gonna work hard, we're gonna work hard too. I've never seen an office hour calendar it's just like every day a whole bunch of them and that was because you guys, you guys were awesome uh, and you were teaching these wonderful sections. Actually, we've had sections for a while now but this is year three of having sections and in sections, you guys got to practice going deeper. It's like lecture, you'd hear the concept. Section, you'd go a bit deeper and after section went a little bit deeper, then on your problem sets, you would be doing it on your own. And then, Time for random variables. Why just have probabilities when you can have random variables? And as we now know, Chris sees random variables and everything, and I hope you too, too. Uh, we talked about a bunch of things about random variables, like expectation and variance. Then we started to learn about classic random variables, like the binomial distribution. Oh, and we sand bits into states that might be corrupted. Good times. We learned about the geometric. <laughs> I love this problem. Oh, how brutal was this problem? It's like so simple. It's like, is that random or is that not random? You're like, ugh. But the geometric is one of the many paths to figuring out that that is not a random series of heads and tails. Uh, we use random variables to solve all sorts of neat problems, like could we store data on DNA? Um, what's the probability of having earthquakes in a certain number of years? What's the problem of extreme weather? We talked about the likelihoods involved in Bitcoin mining. We talked about representative juries in the language of random variables. We even talked about love, because sometimes love's what it's all about. 
But sometimes what it's all about is bloom filters and, <laughs> and all these problems we got to look at through this wonderful new lens. But then we hit this problem. While we were basking in the glory of random variables, there was this hidden issue. What about things that are not discrete? Like the simple, humble, random function from Python. But then we went there, we're like, okay, that doesn't scare us. We're gonna go and think about probabilities in the limits. We had random variables that were continuous and we went from probably mass functions to probably density functions, which was a mind trip, a whole new way of thinking about random variables. And it brought in back the big old scary integrals. But we learned that integrals are loving, not scary. They're our friend. Um, and really this class was more about finding when you need to know the integrals than memorizing all the rules of integrals. This took us down wonderful paths and allowed us to explore new random variables like the very important Gaussian random variable. And of course, what'd you guys get if you integrate over a probability density function? Probability. Ah, yes, fantastic. Um, and then you guys took this and you guys solved some cool problems, like thinking about climate sensitivity, how much our Earth's temperature could change if we double CO2. Ah, we talked about PDFs, you learned about CDFs. Uh, and then we started to apply these random variables. I love this one, and I hope the TAs take this into account. Do you guys remember this? This was the exam scores for the Polish national exam, and look how Gaussian that looks, except for this one part, because that's what a passing grade was. And that's like, this is the nice TA. They were like, no way, man. Oh, look, I found a point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why have one random variable when you could have a whole bunch because so many cool things in the real world involve lots of random variables being random together. And we started this narrative in the simple world of thinking about two random variables together and we had these joint probabilities. Initially there were tables because they were discrete. We learned about classic multivariable random variable types like the multinomial and then we figured out who wrote this Federalist paper, not Hamilton, Madison. And of course, the exciting thing that we worked on through this thing was a general tool to figure out predictions of diseases people could have based on a combination of symptoms. This really huge probabilistic model that you guys worked through. Lots of random variables, it was too exponentially hard for us to deal with, so we built a probabilistic Bayesian network. You know, the idea that led to that great paper that was so inspirational to me. Uh, and not only do we build probabilistic networks, you also learned a randomized algorithm called rejection sampling where you could take any probabilistic random network and you, you could infer any conditional probability you cared about, which was a really, really cool probabilistic algorithm to get to see in your first probability class. At this point, we'd done some cool stuff and you guys had done some cool stuff because you had been doing the hard work at home, but it was time to learn the classics. You know, like some of those beautiful ideas in probability theories. And we started with one of my favorites. We went back and we thought, hey, what if I have uncertainty about probability itself? And we thought about, well, let's say I flipped a coin and I was uncertain if it's true probability being heads. After I observe a certain number of heads and tails, could I rethink about my estimation of the probability? And in the spirit of 109, that everything could be a random variable, we let probability itself be a random variable. And after you observed nine heads and one tails, we figured that if you thought of probability as a random variable, this is your belief distribution, not on whether or not you'll get heads on the next coin flip, but in the probability of heads itself, the beta distribution. What a beautiful piece of theory. And of course, the beautiful piece of theory is not just gonna live in theory land, it's going to help us. And it helped us solving this decision that we call Thompson sampling of making decisions repeatedly under uncertainty. And as I mentioned at the beginning of class, this isn't just something that I teach you because I'm like, yeah, whatever, they should know. It's something that I use and it's so helpful. And I think it could be a tool you might be able to find applications to in problems that people haven't thought about. And you did it. You coded up Thompson sampling. You made that happen on your problem set app. Then we learned the central limit theorem. We took a couple random variables and we added them up together. And we're like, what if we add up this random variable more and more and more? We started out with dice. We're like, okay, we're gonna add dice up together. And we looked at the sum of many dice and it started to look like a Gaussian. We're like, oh, what a coincidence. And then we took a beta and we summed it up. And it was a Gaussian. And we took things that didn't even look like distributions. We summed up lots of samples from them and it always ended up being Gaussian, which led to this crazy idea of the essential limit theorem. If you sum IID random variables, it always leads to a Gaussian. Crazy beauty that exists in our world. 
We then also learned about the crazy beauty that is the bootstrap. We're, you know, it's time to think about the theories behind what scientists do when they have to calculate p-values and we need to think about distribution of statistics themselves. And in the craziest mind trip, we were able to find distribution of statistics based on data itself using the wild, wonderful idea of a bootstrap where we would say, okay, we're gonna take all our data, assume a universal probability mass function, resample, and recalculate new probabilities. And we'd use this to calculate distributions of statistics themselves. And you use this to solve some cool problems, like, hey, should we use mean or medians for peer grading? Um, how, what's the result of an A-B test? What should we think of as its p-value? At this point, we've done counting. We've done core fundamental probability theory. We talked about random variables. We talked a lot about random variables and probabilistic models. And then we got into, our, finished our theory. It was time for our last dance of machine learning. We learned about a bunch of different ways of doing parameter estimation. We learned about maximum likelihood estimation. We learned about maximum a priority. And all of these things led to different algorithms that could do our biggest task that we ended our final problem set on, which was classification. We took three different data sets and we used different algorithms to classify. The two algorithms, and this is still a little fresh. I know some of you guys have just finished like three hours ago. Uh, you wrote logistic regression. And uh, logistic regression that we learned was like the core idea behind deep learning, which is what we talked about last Friday. Or sorry, I guess last Friday was algorithmic fairness. And at this point, you know, you learn two algorithms, naive Bayes and logistic regression, you implement them. We talked about how logistic regression was the cornerstone behind this great idea, which was deep learning. We made the important aside say, this is really complicated tools and we have to be so thoughtful about how they interact with society. And then we're like, the world's still changing. <laughs> and I, we did this uh, class on just Monday where we said, okay, now that you guys have learned all this, could we understand some of the newest tools of our day, like this tool that came out last Thursday, GPT, and this tool that's only been around for a few months, uh, DALI, and how those things can use probability theory to generate images and generate text. This is a little funny. I did want to bring this up. I don't know if anyone's tried this. Don't tell me if you did. <laughs> anyone curious? Like, has anyone used these, these GPTs? The show of hands, you've tried it out. Okay, and put your hands down because I don't want to know who tried to see if it could solve their homework problems. But I did. Did you try? Yeah. <laughs> I tried. Okay, okay. But for, for a class I'm teaching, which is totally legit, right? That's not honor code problem. And so I was like, hey, GPT, can you help me with my homework? It's like, hell yeah, let's do that. <laughs> I'm give you all your solutions. I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> I tried giving you all these CS109 problems and it couldn't solve even the most basic ones. Like, I started with one of the easy ones from problems at five, which is like, well, not that easy. Boy, this was a little bit hard thing. But fair six-sided dice is repeatedly like, no, it's like, that was not easy, Chris. Uh, Six-sided dice is repulled until you get a sum that exceeds 300. What's the probability that it took you at least 80 rolls? And it was so wrong. It did some things that looked pretty reasonable, like it got dice right, it got this, uh, everything is a potato, not a potato right, and then everything was wrong. I was like, uh, pretty sure that's wrong. But hint, why don't you use the central limit theorem? And it's like, oh yeah, the central limit theorem, definitely. And it got the expectation of a dice right, and then it totally got the central limit theorem wrong. It gave such a convincing answer. It was so convincing, but completely wrong. Uh, I think you'd need to understand more to realize how it was wrong than to solve it yourself. So I just want to let you guys know so people don't feel tempted. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Can you guys do me a favor? Class is gonna be over next week. Actually, the problem sets are, uh, app is basically closed. Can anyone see if you can get it to solve? Okay, study, sorry, study. D definitely focus on your exams. You guys don't need to do that. But like, if you really need a distraction, which you don't, you should study. If you need a distraction, which you don't, then uh, if, could you find out if you could get a solution to one of, one of our CS109 questions? Just for fun, maybe over Christmas if you're curious. It's a little, little challenge, and please do let me know, because I am quite curious. Um, okay. Let's talk about CS109 by the numbers, because I think that's kind of interesting. You know, we had more than 30 major keys to help guide you. Uh, maybe more importantly, there's a whole course here with 64 chapters and counting now. Uh, some of them dynamic. Oh, this personal challenge just makes me so happy. And it's made us so happy just looking at the, the fun and wonderful ways that you guys have been exploring probability. Uh, oh, and this is so cute, you guys. My baby started counting this quarter. She can like count to 10. I'm like, oh, that's what I teach. And I'm like, you know, tears in my eyes. It's been so cute. So like, it's just been so fun to both be a father and be your teacher at the same time. And if I could end on a few notes, the most important one is a thank you. I just I appreciate you guys. Thank you to our wonderful TAs. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, you've been a wonderful new head TA. Uh, thank you guys to all the students. Yeah, for our head TA. Uh, and then, you know, thank you to you guys as a class. You just, you made our job so wonderful. It turns out teaching without students is not that fun. Uh, <laughs> and it is because of you that we do what we do and that our jobs are so enjoyable. So thanks for that. And if I could leave on one interesting note is, you guys live in interesting times and there's a lot of excitement out there. And, you know, there was a moment when people were developing all the fundamental theories of addition. And there was a time when people were trying to figure out, oh, what's a function? And they were defining what algebra was. And people were coming up with ideas that we've studied to this day. And you're living in a time that has all that movement. Again, it's scary and it's wild. But it's also, if you imagine what it would be like to live at a time when people like, uh, uh, were inventing all those core fundamental mathematics, from our future perspective, that sounds quite exciting. In the future, people will think about this time and be like, wow, you live in that time when people are inventing things. Chris, what'd you invent? I'm like, uh, not P versus MP. I'm like, why? You missed your chance. Uh, <laughs> but what an exciting time to be living. And, and I do want you guys to think there's all these wonderful problems and you live at a time when they're still open and how exciting is that? And you're at a wonderful place. There's so many tools and resources and ideas floating around Stanford. What a great time to be learning all these things. What a great place to be. I hope you guys can feel some of that energy and, and whatever your future path is, be it going into research, be it going to further classes, be it this could be your last stop in CS and you go apply these things into wonderful other new fields. Whatever your future path is, just know that we're so appreciative of having you in class, that we're rooting for you on your future, uh, uh, whatever that is. And then maybe I'd say, don't be a stranger. You know, you see Coho, say hi. <laughs> if you see me walking around, uh, please, please do say hi. I'd really appreciate it. Because, you know, now we're going to go on to Christmas and, and we'll miss you all. Okay. Come to the review. You have a great review on Friday. Come to the final. Definitely come to the final. That'll be next Tuesday. Uh, and then we'll say, yeah. Um, and then you guys, all the best. Uh, and I really mean that. Uh, don't be a stranger. Have a wonderful rest of your day. CS 109.